With the rise of generative AI, there is a huge surge in demand for artificial intelligence jobs. Now, I want you, if you're watching this video, if you're not already in artificial intelligence, I want you to get into an artificial intelligence career. I get a lot of questions about getting into AI jobs, and so I figured today I would talk about, one, my personal experience in getting into an AI career, as well as some tips and tricks from the front lines of people that I've talked to, because I've talked to quite a lot of people, and also what I look for when I'm hiring people. Now, I'm not presently hiring people, but I have previously hired people for AI jobs. So let's get into it. First, let me tell you a little bit about my story, kind of where it all started. My first foray into artificial intelligence was back in about 2009, when I started tinkering with evolutionary algorithms and what we now call deep learning, although we didn't call it that back then, back in 2009 with C++. And I didn't get very far, but you know, I was playing with it back then. All of my friends were in engineering school, and so that was just kind of where I was at. This is also when you know 3D printing was up and coming. My my friend just reminded me of the days back of of the rep wraps. So if you don't remember that, go look it up. Um, and then also drones were new, but you had to build your own from parts. There was no you know DJI you know drones that you could just buy off the shelf. Uh, and then SLAM was also invented. So that's simultaneous localization and mapping, which is now, if you've ever seen the Tesla's, you know, the view from the Tesla's perspective where it's constantly, you know, building a 3D map of its environment, that's SLAM. That was where we were at at the time. That was like the dark ages compared to where we're at now. So that's when I got started. Now, I'm not saying that if you want to get into it, you have to go back and start back then. I'm just pointing out that that was 14 years ago. Success doesn't happen overnight, but so that means the best time to get started is yesterday, but the second best time to get started is right now. So over the preceding years, I revisited artificial intelligence a few times. I discovered Kaggle. So I listened to a bunch of podcasts. I started with Data Skeptic. Um, so Data Skeptic is a good podcast to listen to if you want to get in on the more technical side. Brain Inspired is another good podcast if you want to listen to a more technical one to kind of understand what's going on behind the scenes rather than just listen to AI news. And so that's that's a really critical thing is just to get oriented to how big this field is. It's not just a matter of listening to the more business flashy sides like, you know, here's a cool new AI tool. Uh, you really want to kind of get in into the algorithmic space, like learning what's going on, what what papers are being presented at the conferences, uh, that sort of thing. Because the more you know about kind of the underlying math and the underlying theory, the better you'll be able to adapt to this environment as it continues to grow. Because like, yes, one tool might seem very different from another, like chat GPT might seem very different from stable diffusion and that sort of other thing. But if you understand how advances in loss function math applies to all of these things, you'll understand the underlying principles that drive it all. So in my particular case, the kind of the, the first big project that I got into that taught me a lot about handling data and stuff was stock market analysis. I wanted to make more money and I had some spare time at my day job because I was an automation engineer. And once you build up enough automation, you just tend to the machines that tend to the other machines. Um, and so I just took those skills that I developed with PowerShell and moved it over to Python. I learned Python, you know, sitting at my desk on Udacity and I wanted to do more stock trades. And so I signed up for an account uh, to download not real time stock data, but like it was updated every morning. So I had near real time stock data going back many, many years. And of course, if you have 8000 stocks with, you know, a whole a whole bunch of tabular data going back many years, that's literally millions of data points. So I had to learn everything about, you know, handling data. Uh, and then how do you prepare that data for machine learning? How do you how do you cluster it? How do you do regressions? Those sorts of things. And so that really served as kind of the bedrock of my education with understanding machine learning and data science. What I really want to drive home is you need projects. You need to have something where you started and you carried it through to completion and you had to learn a lot as you went. This is one of the number one things that employers are going to be looking for, particularly because employers know that not everyone has been in AI and machine learning forever. So they want to know that like, hey, if I give you so think, put yourself in the shoes of an employer, I'm going to give you a project or a problem that I know you haven't solved before. 
that I know that nobody has solved before. Why? Because this is where we're at. This is what we're doing. And we are in, we're forging a path. We're inventing stuff as we go. So I want to see employees or prospective employees, candidates that have demonstrated that they are saying, hey, this thing doesn't exist, but I want it to exist. So let me figure out everything that's required to make that thing exist. So that's what I did with my stock analysis stuff. I was so proud of it back in the day. I made a little bit of money with it. Um, it was nothing to write home about in the grand scheme of things, especially, you know, fast forwarding almost 10 years because I was working on that back in 2014, 2015, 2016-ish. Now you can just take a picture of a stock graph and ask chat GPT to do a technical analysis on it. You don't need linear re regression or, you know, time series data or anything. You just give it a picture now. And actually that was one of the things that I was going to try if I had stuck around with it. Anyways, so the point there though is project-based learning. PBL, PBL, PBL. It's all the rage in education today. It is doubly important in the professional world. So when my my ex-wife who was a teacher taught me about PBL, I was like, that's what my career is. That is literally what my entire career was predicated on. And it's actually how I launched my YouTube channel. Most of my videos today are explainers and, and I'm less in the tutorials and demos. But if you go to my oldest videos, it's all project-based learning. It's all, hey, I'm going to try and solve this problem. And then let's fig let's fudge as we go. And one of the things that people liked most was that I would show like what didn't work because learning what doesn't work and why is actually more important than just learning what does work. And this is actually one of the primary problems with education today is they don't lead you all the uh, down all the dead ends. So that's kind of the foundation that I had. Again, want to reiterate the importance of having a self-directed project that you take through to completion. And even if it doesn't change the world, the fact that you took it to completion is the number one thing that employers are going to want to see. Now, it's even better if you can demonstrate it on GitHub or YouTube or whatever else, um, because if you're not doing that, someone else who wants that job is. And so it's a very competitive marketplace, but it's not a winner takes all solution, especially when you have a lot of unmet demand. And 2024, we're going to see a tr huge, huge surge in unmet demand in terms of these AI jobs. So PBL is critical. Now, how do you do PBL? How do you find the thing that you work on? First, intrinsic motivation. What is it that you are naturally curious about? There is no substitute for passion, so start where you're passionate and go from there. One of the major mistakes that I see people making is they're like, well, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm, I want to, I want to do this just because I want to get rich or, you know, I will, I will like what, what projects are going to be most marketable. I don't care about that. Like I want to see, I want to see one evidence for passion because there's no substitute for passion. And if someone has no passions, if they're not engaged with their passions, if they're just a little worker drone who all that they do is just, I don't know what they do. They sit on the couch and watch anime all day. I don't know. Um, but if you're not engaged with your passions, you're not an energetic person and you're not going to be a good employee in, in, in my estimation, because someone who's engaged with their passions, they have, this is going to, to older depth psychology. They have more libido. They have more hedonic energy for life, which means that they're going to be engaged in a way that is more active, more proactive rather than reactive or passive. Because one of the worst things to see in, in a prospective employee is someone that you need to hold their hand every step of the way because they're not actively engaged, because they're like, I don't really know what to do. So you want to see someone who has that drive, who has that ambition, who's going to go make a change, who's going to go figure something out on their own. Uh, you need to solve problems and document them. Like I said, ideally GitHub and or YouTube or wherever else you can document them. If you do have good projects that are not public, then you at least need to be prepared to talk about them or share it privately or something like that. Um, in the before times, before you know LinkedIn and GitHub were kind of central as they are today, you would use a resume to apply to a job and that sort of thing. That's less and less important today because like, you know, you get jobs through LinkedIn job postings, which it's like you just, you know, hit fast apply. And having gone through that, like I learned not to trust resumes, like a resume to me is like, do you, is it the minimum threshold? But the thing is, is I've talked to people with stellar resumes who like what you see in the billboard is not what you get. And conversely, I've, I've seen resumes that were not that great. And the person was like actually pretty good. 
Um, so a resume is like, it's, the information is just not there. But if you have a terrible resume, you're more likely to get passed over if you even use that. But again, what I care more about is like, I want to see your LinkedIn and I want to see your GitHub. I want to see those things first and foremost. Another lesson, and this is more paradoxical, is give away everything. Everything that you figure out, everything that you learn, give it away for free. And, you know, the, there's a lesson, I think it's in the Bible somewhere, I've never read the Bible, but it's like, the more you give, the more you shall receive. Um, that is 100% true, and it's how I got to where I am today, um, by literally solving problems and giving away the solutions as much as possible. And the reason is because, one, ethics. Like, people are going to like someone who has that ethos more than someone who's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play all my cards close to my vest. Um, because then it's like, well, if you hold stuff back at all times, the employer is going to assume that you're holding stuff back from them as well. Um, and like, just think, think of it this way. Like, unless you're hiring like a secret agent, you don't want someone who plays their cards close to their vest or like maybe a private iron investigator or whatever, unless, unless the job calls for it. Um, you don't want to see that characteristic in someone. Instead, you want to see someone who is just so effusive with their problem solving and like that they just want to get the solutions out into the world. That is the, that is the correct ethos for a tech person. And that is the correct ethos for AI. So here's why that is even more important for team dynamics is because it is assumed that people are going to be learning as they go. And so the worst, the most toxic team members that I've ever had in the tech space are the ones that kept that hoarded knowledge and kept things to themselves because they're like, well, if I give this away, then, then I'm not going to be needed anymore. And it's like, those are actually the, those are the people that you actively try and get rid of from an organization. The higher ups, the, the, the middle managers and the senior managers, they know who those people are, the people who hoard their knowledge. And those are the exact people that you, that are like first on the list to replace. Why? Because it's like, if that person gets sick, if they die, if they decide to leave, that is a huge risk to the company. And it's like, we don't have room for people who are going to hoard knowledge and keep things to themselves. Instead, we want people who are going to like compulsively share everything. And the way that I think about it is the more I shared with my team, the less they needed, the, the less they relied on me. But here's the thing is like, like my entire career was corporate career was based on that ethos of, I want to make sure that my team doesn't need me personally. But the reason that that makes you valuable and that it makes you stick around is because your management, your, you know, your low level management, your middle management, and even your senior management will see that. They'll say, hey, this person elevates the entire team. Therefore, whatever team you put them on, they're going to raise the performance of the entire team by sharing everything. And so if you, if you actually valorize, if you place value on educating people, that is a skill and that makes you more valuable to the entire organization. So again, like give away everything, just get into the mindset, get into the open source mindset of I'm going to solve every problem that I can and I'm going to publish the results. That is the ethos that we want to see. And that will also open many doors to you because I can't tell you, like even before I started Patreon, even before I, I really got big on YouTube, I had people offering jobs to me because of that ethos. And actually, so one of the stories earlier in my Patreon and consulting you know, AI consulting career was that I started doing that because people kept coming to me and saying like, basically like, shut up and take my money. I want you to solve this problem for me. I still have people doing that. And I, I told people no back then because I didn't identify as an AI expert and I didn't identify as an AI consultant, but then they're like, we want you to solve this problem. And now I'm on the other side of that where I tell people no, because I've got other stuff that I'm working on. Anyways, give away everything. That is the primary ethos. So like the two biggest lessons Project-based learning, follow your passions, like do something big, create something that didn't exist and document it. And then number two is give away everything. So the third pillar of how to get in, how to build an AI career is treat AI as the new basic competency. If you are computer literate, like you know how email works, you know how internet works, you know how Excel works, AI is the next Microsoft Office. Treat AI as a basic competency. If you understand word processing and email and all this other stuff, now you need prompt engineering. You need to master the English language because most languages, most language models are trained primarily on English. They do work in other languages and there's actually advantages to using multiple languages, but that's more advanced. But you need to master prompt engineering, prompt strategies, techniques, learn to communicate. It is primarily communication. 
This is written, this is verbal, this is nonverbal, but the underpinning principle is communicating, getting an idea from your head into another head, whether it's the machine or a human or whatever. The better you are at communicating with humans, the better you are at communicating with machines. This is why marketers, journalists, librarians, people that read a lot, people that write a lot, this is why they just, you put them in front of chat GPT and they're like, cool, look at all the things it can do. And sometimes you put an engineer in front of it and they're like, I don't understand what this thing can do. It is the wildest phenomenon. If you don't believe me, like talk to people, like there are so many engineers out there that you put them in front of a language model and they're like, what can this do? It can't do anything. And then you put it in front of someone who studied philosophy, study, someone who studied you know the humanities, history, whatever, They'll like start interrogating and like, can it do this, this, and this? And so people that are comfortable with communicating, people that are comfortable with language, they are several steps ahead of engineers. And I'll talk more about that mentality in just a minute, but like learn English, learn prompting, learn, learn to write. And actually I have a book to recommend. If you're an engineer and you want to think about language more systematically, like natural language, because all languages are, whether it's constructed, whether it's Python or C or C sharp or whatever, that's a constructed language, natural language, same thing. You need to think about them, not just as math is the best thing in the world, learn natural language and this book, it was the best of sentences. It was the worst of sentences. This is the single best book I've ever read on the construction of sentences. Here's a story. As a consultant, one of the primary things that I had to do, and this is actually why I got tired of consulting because it was the same story every day, is that a bunch of engineers have said, oh, the model can't do this. The model, model is broken. It doesn't work. And I'm like, well, show me your prompt. And I'm like, I can't understand the damn thing that you wrote. Do you understand how to communicate? Like these instructions are garbage. If a human can't follow the, the instructions, then your instructions are broken and the model sure as hell can't follow the instructions. Um, and so then I'm just like, when, when I was like making a career on just helping people with basic English, I'm like, this is not fulfilling to me anymore. Like go read a book. I'm going to go do things that are more interesting and more challenging. And I know that's really condescending, but that's also partly why I'm making this video and read this book. Seriously, this book, read this one and get better at English and communication. And then you will get better with language models. I promise. Not only that, but learning to communicate is one of the most important team skills. If you can express your ideas clearly to your management, to your team members, whatever, that is just absolutely imperative. So those are kind of the three primary pillars. AI is a basic competency, having a capstone PBL based project, uh, following your passion, like all those things. So now I want to talk about a little bit what I look for. I've already mentioned some of these, but I want to go into a little bit more depth. So the first thing that I look for when I'm trying to hire someone is I go to their LinkedIn. If someone doesn't have a, a real picture or they don't have their real full name, I assume that they're paranoid and I don't want to work with them. And the reason, and I've actually talked to people and some people have explained like, well, I don't want to get doxxed. It's like, okay, but you're in the minority. And like less than 1% of people are actually afraid of getting doxxed. So that means that if you have a fake LinkedIn profile or an incomplete LinkedIn profile, because you're in the top 1% of paranoid people, I sure as heck don't want to work with you. So like I actually frequently go through my LinkedIn and I will remove people that have no picture or a fake picture or an incomplete name or whatever, because it's like, I don't know who you are. If I don't know who you are, there's no trust and I'm not going to work with you. And I don't even want to associate with those people. There are plenty of other reasons that people might explain that they don't have it, but you got to, you got to understand that if your LinkedIn profile is deliberately incomplete, it either shows that you're completely not engaged with the modern world or you're paranoid or some, some other set of criteria that just kind of singles you out as like, I don't want to work with that person. Now I have had people say that they, they keep some stuff off their LinkedIn profile for security reasons, for NDA reasons. They might be involved in the intelligence community, that sort of thing. I don't know whether or not I believe that. I actually have connections with people who were colonels in the United States Air Force who did have clearances and they still have like their LinkedIn profile is complete. So again, like Something that if you have, if you have to open with a lot of excuses, that's generally going to be a no. Number two is I looked at someone's GitHub. I want to see a GitHub that is active, that has a bunch of repositories. If it's all just forks, I don't really care. If it's empty, it's generally going to be a pass because again, if I don't see that you're actively engaged with this stuff, like as a hobby in your free time, then you're not that into technology. You're not that passionate about it. 
and you're not really engaged with the modern world. So it, like if your LinkedIn is bad, that's a no. If your GitHub is empty, that's a no. And then finally, communication skills. Uh, I look for crystal clear communication. I set the bar very high and very few people are at that level. And I understand that because I'm an, I am now a professional communicator. But at the same time, communication written, like verbal and nonverbal written and, and, and verbal communication are basic business competencies. If you are like relatively far into your career and you haven't figured that out, I probably don't want to work with you because communication is just so important. So whether it's jumbled rambling communication, and I know that I am like the worst at, at rambling sometimes, but sparse communication is also bad. If someone doesn't know what detail to add, if someone is not like understanding like the salient details to add, if it's difficult to get the correct information out of someone, that's also a big red flag. So speaking of red flags, I want to talk about a few other red flags. So number one, shyness and hesitance. I understand that some people are introverts. I'm a big introvert, but I am not shy and I'm not hesitant. So don't conflate being an introvert with social anxiety and being a fearful person. If you're too restrained, then that tells me that you're not going to speak up when it matters. You're, you might not even have good boundaries. You're not going to be assertive about what you need and your own learning. And you might not even be that assertive about your own abilities. I'm going to pick on my wife a little bit because when I met her, she was like this. And this is what I've actually coached her on in, in her career is because she was she grew up in a very competitive environment. She was taught by her toxic academic environment, don't speak up or you're going to get pounced on. Um, but I was like, no, like you need to get over that. Like if you know something, speak up. And so then when she went from academia to private industry, she's like actually being rewarded for knowing a thing. And this is one of the many reasons I sometimes criticize academia, particularly in America, is because it is so toxic, like academia punishes people for actually knowing. And it's like, stay in your lane. You don't have the seniority. Sit down, shut up and just do your work. And I'm like, this is incredibly toxic. Like when you dump on people who are actually intelligent, who are actually empathetic, who are actually good at communicating, like you have a toxic institution. So speak up, work through your social anxiety. There are books for that. There is therapy for that. There is all kinds of things that you can do. I don't want to work with people that have a lot of social anxiety and a lot of fear because, again, they're not going to speak up when it matters. They're also not going to be assertive about learning. And when you if you want to get into an AI career, when it's this hot and it's competitive, you need to be more assertive, plain and simple. Another big red flag is people that use a lot of hyperbole or have a silver tongue. And so between my professional career and now my my career in YouTubing, um, I've talked to literally thousands of people, whether it was coworkers, people that I've interviewed, vendors, people that I'm interviewing, you know, people that approach me, consulting, all kinds of stuff. I already talked about how a big red flag is people who who like keep things close to their vest. Huge red flag. Smooth talkers, people that come off as manipulative, also huge red flag. One manipulative person can disrupt the dynamic on an entire team, and you also don't know like what's their motivation. Um, and also 99% of manipulative people are hiding the fact that they are incompetent. There are some manipulative people are manipulative because they're good. They're, they're, they're very manipulative and they just enjoy the social games and whatever. But 99% of manipulative people are incompetent and they're hiding it by being a smooth talker. And like I, I'm th sitting here thinking, I know one person who is man manipulative and good Everyone else who, that I've ever met who was manipulative was incompetent and toxic and just drove everything into the ditch. And so basically it's like, well, I don't have the technical chops, but I'm going to try and, you know, use my schmoozing skills. So that's like huge red flag. If people are overly excited, and so this, this is another red flag, if people get onto an interview or a team and they're just like, you know, like their, their energy is like a little fireball that can't be contained... Um, that's a big red flag because like, yes, having energy is good. Being assertive is good. But if it's just like untamed, like wildfire, that's no good. Like you need to, you need to be in control of your emotions. And so here's another thing is since I became a YouTuber, since I've, I've got some internet fame, some people get starstruck when they get on a call with me and that's fine. Um, but if someone can't regulate that like excitement, then like that's a bad sign. Now, on the other hand, if someone is super dismissive, that's also a bad sign because they're like, oh, whatever. That's also a sign of like someone who's who's making a point of playing it cool. 
that's a form of manipulation, which I'm autistic. I see all of that stuff. So like, don't pull that on me. <laughs> like, I want to see like plain vanilla authenticity. I want to see genuine affect and emotional self-regulation. Why? Because that's what, that's what's been expected of me. And then another red flag, and I've already mentioned this one, so I want to talk about it a little bit more, is anyone who speaks negatively of English or natural language. One of the most common refrains is, well, natural language is just too fragile. It's too weak. You can't do anything with it. And it's like, yeah, talk to someone who's like actually an English major. This is a, this is primarily an education problem. It's also the fact that we've valorized STEM for a long time. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And so when you say math is superior and you say engineering is superior, language is dumb, the humanities are dumb. When you create a social hierarchy around knowledge and skills, one, that's just completely idiotic. All knowledge is worth having. All skills are worth having. So if someone says, well, language is not useful, I'm like, well, as a writer, I disagree. As a communicator, I disagree. And so that's going to be a hard no. And I cannot tell you the number of generally young people who message me and they're like, hey, I just finished my, my master's in CS. What do I do next? And I'm like, learn English. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, fucking learn English. Like you, you asked me for advice. Like you came to me, learn English. And so again, book. Read and write. Too many mathematically inclined people are just drastically undereducated about language. But like, if you suck at communication, you probably think that communication is dumb and that language is dumb. If you're good at communication, you understand why this is valuable. And you'll also have just an automatic leg up, not just with using language models, but professionally and personally. Communication skills are the yardstick of being a mature human adult. So I cannot beat that drum hard enough get good at communication broadly, written and verbal communication, all of the above. And then I'll close on a few green flags. So one of the biggest green flags that I look for, or that, that really kind of gets my attention when I'm talking to someone, is when they have exceptional detailed knowledge of a thing. When they have the depth, when they can focus on the most poignant and salient details of a thing and communicate them very well, I'm like, this person knows what they're talking about. And this is the, like, this is something that I recognize because it's something that I do. And this is actually what I've kind of built my communication career on, which is having that very thoughtful kind of deep way of talking about something from different angles, having the depth of understanding, having, having clearly developed the mental models around a thing to say, okay, you know what you're talking about. You know how to get at the depth of something. Very often when I'm interviewing someone or where I'm trying to you know, ascertain their depth, I'll ask probing questions to try and get them to go deeper. And it's weird. Sometimes it's like hitting a brick wall. They're like, well, it could be this other thing. And I'm like, it's very, very obvious when someone does not have the depth. So exceptional detail, depth of understanding, that is a huge green flag. So if, if someone avoids it, I'm like, why? Do you, you either don't know it or you're ashamed of it, or you're, you have imposter syndrome, that sort of thing. I have actually had that in an interview where someone like told me after, cause I told them, no, I'm like, you didn't really have the depth. They're like, well, I was like, I was holding back because I didn't know like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, well, again, that goes back to that shyness and hesitance. If you're going to hold back because you're have imposter syndrome or you're whatever, you're insecure about what you know, if you're not if you're not confident about what you know, I can't trust that you're going to, you know, give me your full self when the rubber meets the road. Communication skills, I've already talked about about that enough. If someone, you know, if someone's a smooth operator, if they're manipulative, you know, like yes, you might say, oh, "Well, if I'm really good at talking, that's that's what no, I want to see authenticity, I want to see sincerity, and I want to I want to see clarity." Very finally, I've already alluded to this is creative hobbies. People with creative hobbies are far and away the most intellectually well-rounded people that I know and have worked with. And I say this as someone who is in a sci-fi writing group and many of the people that I that are that are my sci-fi writing friends are also in STEM. They are the smartest, most thoughtful people that I know. Um, and that can be reading, writing, any kind of art, acting, theater is a big one, if you can express yourself. And so there are a lot of technical people that have creative jobs. If you're a maker of any kind, if you build drones and 3D printers, or if you forge daggers and hatchets or whatever, 
if you do something with your hands and your brain other than just pure technology that is about creating something and putting it out into the world, whether it's an expressive hobby, such as writing or acting or singing, or if it's a making hobby where you're saying like, hey, there's a thing that doesn't exist and I'm going to go make it exist. If you build furniture, that is a creative hobby. That's something I used to do. Um, creative hobbies tell you a lot about someone's, their, their intellect, but also how they engage with the world and the fact that they're willing to put something out there and put it on display. And so I'll revise something. I said, you know, GitHub, if someone were to apply to a job and they say, well, I don't have a GitHub, but here's my portfolio of like daggers that I've made. I'd be like, cool, you are a maker. I want to hire that person. <laughs> like, because they're also going to, it shows that they go and find skills um, on their own. It shows that they care about something enough to go put energy and money and time into it on their own. And that is that is one of the, the deepest character traits that you can't train someone. So I'll leave you with a final, final lesson. Hire for the personality, train for the skills. And so if you're watching this on the hiring side, you're going to have a hard time finding the right skills because they don't exist yet. So you hire for personality, you train for skills. Whatever side of the table you're on, whether you're a job seeker or a hiring manager, that's like the key thing. So you hire for the things that you can't train for. You hire for those intrinsic personality traits, and then you train the rest. All right, that's my rant. Cheers.